Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth Arthur de la Villarmoa. I'm currently a postdoc fellow at the Pontificia Universidad Católica in Chile and uh, I'm going to talk about accretion towards embedded sources, the way from the envelope to the stars through the disk. So this is our uh, current uh, knowledge of a uh, low mass star formation and uh, maybe you have seen this picture many times but um, the question that uh, uh, we want to answer right now is the when do planets form? And uh, some years ago, uh, we thought that they form in class two disks where the envelope material is uh, almost dissipated and the uh, dust particles start to settle in the mid plane. Um, so now uh, this is a big question mark because with the recent observations, we have seen uh, structures uh, like uh, rings, caps, and spirals. And this is the D sharp uh, project uh, of uh, a class two or Titauri disks, yeah, older than 0.5 uh, mega years. Um, so these sources uh, or these observations came after, uh, of course, the very famous HL Tau. And this is the source that uh, we have to thank uh, in this conference because it has a the of course the name and uh, it's after this HL Tau that uh, it was a revolution and um, more sources um, began to be observed in the dust continuum emission and we started to see all these uh, structures. If these structures are related with the planet formation then we have to think that the uh, first steps of planet formation may occur earlier than 0.5 uh, million years. So this is what we think nowadays. And also uh, there was a recent uh, work this year about the uh, mass of solids in disks in a class two, class one and class zero disks and also mass of solids in exoplanets uh, that uh, um, we can observe, for example, with the Kepler mission or TESS uh, right now. The conclusion of this work was that uh, class two disks uh, do not have enough mass to form the observed planetary systems, and therefore um, uh, class zero and class one disks are more suitable for the first steps of planet formation. So. Ah, okay, and this, uh, of course, planet formation should occur uh, before 0.5 uh, million years in the class one or zero sources. So this is uh, what we believe nowadays, uh, that planet formation start to occur in these stages. And the important fact of these sources is that we have uh, an important envelope component. Uh, and also we have very powerful outflows. And the envelope component uh, will bring more info material to the disk and of course uh, maybe more turbulence and the question will be how efficient is uh, the planet formation when we take into account the envelope and also um, the mass accretion rates related with these sources that are higher than mass accretion rates of uh, class 2 disks. And this is a, the, a theoretical work a few years ago, or a long time ago, in the 98, uh, when we have the H and the versus the um, mass accretion rates. We have that uh, for embedded sources, um, the mass accretion rate is not uh, constant with time, but uh, it will occur in uh, episodic bursts of accretion. And as time goes on, uh, it will decrease. And uh, of course, they wouldn't, uh, at, at some point, um, the accretion will stop. Uh, so this is a theoretical work. And the question is, uh, how does the material infall from the envelope to the disk? And also, how does the material accrete from the disk onto the protostar? And uh, I will uh, talk a bit more about the observational uh, um, part of this uh, plot. So for this, um, we have um, ALMA observations of 10 sources, 10 class one sources in the Ophiuchus molecular cloud. 
Um, this is the nearby star forming region and we selected uh, uh, sources in these uh, ranges of uh, volumetric temperature and volumetric luminosity. And we also have uh, these tracers, shock tracers and envelope tracers, but uh, um, here I will only talk about disk and shock tracers. And this is the continuum emission in band seven. We see emission in all the sources and also this, uh, these are binaries. And for the uh, disk tracers, um, this is the particular case of uh, C17O. This was very important because uh, we studied the disk dynamics and uh, by fitting a uh, position velocity diagrams, we can estimate the mass of the protostar. And the mass of the protostar is related with the mass accretion rate. And before the only observable in this equation was the volumetric luminosity, but now with um, disk tracers, we can, only, we can also estimate the protostellar mass. And with this, we did a plot of a protostellar mass versus the volumetric luminosity. And we plot here um, class one sources in red and class zero sources in blue. The field uh, point dots are data from our observations and the other ones are from the literature, in particular from us at all in 2015. If we fit only the class one sources, we find a nice um, a linear correlation between the protostellar mass and the volumetric luminosity because the, um, the index here is uh, 1.1. And, uh, and we also find an average mass accretion rate of uh, 2.4 times uh, 10 to the minus seven solar masses per year. So here I plot uh, the ranges, uh, 10 to the minus seven and 10 to the minus six, and almost all the sources uh, lie in this, uh, between, within this range. And um, this, uh, if we want to take, to think that the mass accretion rate is constant with time. Uh, this is not consistent with, um, with the observables of uh, volumetric luminosity and also uh, final masses. And this was also known as the luminosity problem, but this is like the um, um, observational uh, part of the problem. So this is consistent with the variable mass accretion rate. Uh, so the accretion must occur in uh, episodic bursts. And uh, most of the sources are in a quiescent state of accretion and they will gain a significant amount of, amount of mass in, short, uh, in a short period of time. And also the question here is, um, what about plan planet formation? Because uh, usually in T Tauri or class two disks, uh, for planet formation models, they use a mass accretion rate of 10 to the minus eight mass, uh, solar masses per year. And that will be something like here. Sorry. Um, now the question is how efficient is the uh, planet formation if we use this observed values of the mass accretion rate. And uh, also the sources with the, related with the higher mass accretion rate are also the ones that we see uh, emission of uh, SO2. And the SO2 emission was a surprise for us because it was like a different, uh, it was uh, unexpected. Uh, we see a very compact emission uh, that um, um, is consistent with the continuum emission here in the black contours. The, uh, it is also related with, with the high velocities from minus 10 to 10 kilometers per second. And the emission is also perpendicular to the outflow direction. So we propose that the SO2 is tracing accretion shocks and this will be uh, shocks um, located at the interface between the inner envelope and the disk surface. And um, so we have a, like a infalling from the envelope uh, to the disk that uh, it is somehow reflected in SO2 emission 
And also the disk tracers are giving us an idea of uh, the mass accretion rate from the disk to the uh, protostar. And um, uh, also the um, SO2 is linked to the higher mass, uh, um, higher volumetric luminosity, therefore to the high mass accretion rates that we can link again to this uh, plot. So these two are the sources with SO2 emission. So somehow this SO2 can be um, a good tracer of a higher, high mass accretion rates. And as a summary, we have an envelope, a disk and the protostar, and we can link the envelope with the disk with the SO2 that is tracing accretion shocks and the disk with the protostar with disk tracers. And uh, we see that the accretion must occur in bursts. And uh, this will increase the volumetric luminosity and also the mass accretion rate. And uh, now if uh, I go back to this uh, theoretical plot, I put the observations now uh, of uh, class zero and class one sources that are lies, they lie in this uh, range. This is what we observe and also from data from the literature. And the thing is that um, this is the typical value used in models of planet formation. And uh, the question now will be, is planet formation efficient with higher mass accretion rate values? The ones that we find in this range, for example, for class one sources and earlier in class zero sources in this range. Of course, this needs a more observations, but this is the, the ranges that we find in, with this work. And uh, with this, I finished. Thank you. <laughs>